Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. Happy Friday. I hope everyone has had a good week. You know, probably for a lot of you, hasn't been a good week because I'm just feeling like there is a shift in the spirit of the American people right now and people are at their breaking point with this quarantine thing. People are just getting restless. Yes, you have a lot of panic still out there. You've got a lot of fear. You've got a lot of people that are saying, I'm just gonna stay locked down forever. But I would say, for the majority of people, even people in New York and New York City, even people in California where there happens to be a pretty high number of cases, um, they are saying, you know what, I've gotta get out. Like, especially if you've got little kids, you gotta be able to go to the park. You gotta be able to go do some sort of recreation. I feel like people are at their breaking point. So if you are at your breaking point and you are not in a state that is loosening restrictions, so I think it's Texas, Florida, South Dakota, Georgia, maybe Colorado, there are probably some other states in there too. If you're not in one of those states and you're in one of those states where government officials are cracking down and people are literally getting arrested for like playing in the park the wrong way, then you maybe didn't have a good week. And I just want you to know that I am praying for you. So I have a prayer list that, uh, or a prayer schedule that I posted on Instagram a few times. It's like my quarantine prayer schedule. And every morning at breakfast, I read a Bible story to our baby and then we pray. She is only 10 months old, so I can't say that she's contributing to the prayer very much, but we pray for whatever is on the quarantine schedule for prayer that day. And so we've got nurses, we've got government leaders, we've got the persecuted in the universal church, we've got the people who don't know Jesus, we've got the people, we've got people in our family, friends, and things like that. So each day is something different. Pray for yourself, that God would sanctify you and draw you close during this time. But I think I'm gonna add to my quarantine schedule people who have reached their sinking limit when it comes to this quarantine because it's serious like the effects of feeling cooped up and feeling isolated and feeling trapped are serious psychologically they're serious financially uh, for unfortunately a lot of uh, children they are uh, serious physically as well we have seen study after study one uh, from North Texas I think it was CBS that reported this that child abuse rates are skyrocketing right now because unfortunately frustrated parents they are home more with their kids their kids are probably demanding a lot right now they're probably drinking more people keep joking about how everyone's trying to drink their way through quarantine for most people yeah that's funny and it's no big deal but for a lot of people who are drinking more the consequences of that are dire and these kids are getting the uh, short end of the stick when it comes to that they are getting the brunt of that kind of behavior and irresponsibility and feelings of feelings of parents being cooped up maybe not having the same financial resources they had having to learn how to homeschool i think the vast majority of parents are handling that really well but some parents aren't and so unfortunately some kids a lot of kids i'm sure are getting emotionally abused physically abused not to mention this entire toxic mommy culture online which i did a podcast episode on titled toxic toxic mommy culture that glorifies really hating your kids and viewing your kids as brats and burdens if you feel defensive when i say that or if you have contention with that please go listen to the episode first titled toxic mommy culture um, so unfortunately, like I said, there are, um, there are repercussions to all of this, especially for the most vulnerable, especially for children. And as other people have pointed out, Bethany Mandel on Twitter pointed this out a while ago, and I thought this was a really good point. Um, she said that we haven't thought about, we haven't talked about the consequences of all this stuff for kids. Like we talk about how hard this is as a parent to homeschool. I know that's true for a lot of you, how hard it is to be cooped up or to have to work from home. And of course, all those things are hard. It's hard to lose your job. All of those things are very difficult and no one is discounting any of that. However, it's also difficult for kids. They don't understand any of this stuff. They're not getting to play with their friends. They're not getting to... Um, go to school they probably honestly for most of you homeschooling and complaining about homeschooling which I'm not saying it's not hard I don't have school age kids so I know that that has to be really difficult but like your kids probably don't want you to be their teacher either like they probably miss their teacher they probably miss the classroom if you're not a homeschool teacher or if, if you're not homeschooling your kids uh, they probably miss their you know normal recreation and routine 
and things like that. Like this is also really hard for children, not just on an abuse level, but also on an adjustment level. Like think about, and we're, I know this isn't exactly what we're going to talk about today or not was uh, I was planning on talking about today and we will get to the out of shadow stuff, I promise. However, I, I want to get to this stuff first and then we'll finish the episode with that and I'll give you a pretty thorough explanation of how I feel about the Out of Shadows documentary. But there are repercussions uh, for these kids who don't understand what's going on, especially kids with special needs. So if you have ever been around uh, a child with autism, uh, he or really any special need, but especially with autism, all children, yes, flourish in some kind of routine, but it can be more flexible. The older children get, they're able to go with the flow, they're able to adjust. Well, that's not true for a lot of people who are on the autism spectrum. They have to have things uh, be the same for them to be comfortable, for them to function. Now, it depends on how high functioning a person with autism is. If you're on the higher end of the spectrum, then you can kind of maybe roll with the punches. But if you are more high needs as a person with autism, it is very difficult to go out of your routine, to have uh, different people around you, to even not uh, I don't know, eat the same food. It just kind of depends, I guess, on what your everyday schedule was before quarantine. But think about those parents of the people with special needs who don't have the same help, who don't have the same access to treatments, who maybe lost their jobs, and it's just a whole other level of financial responsibility when you have kids with special needs. Think about those kids, think about uh, those parents, think about how burdensome this lockdown really is to so many people, people who can't get their same cancer treatments. Thankfully, I know a lot of people who have cancer who are able to get their cancer tr treatments right now, and that's great, but some people uh, reportedly are not able to do that. Other kinds of surgeries that maybe your state government sees as elective, but is actually very necessary for your, uh, for your health. There are all kinds of repercussions and consequences to this that um, unfortunately, it seems like a lot of government leaders are, if they are mentally taking them into account they are not willing to actually act on it because they are afraid of the media blowback. And there was this very stupid conversation, a very stupid conversation on Twitter, and a lot of conversations on Twitter are very, very stupid. But it started with uh, the name Ben Shapiro was trending, and I am sure that all of you know who Ben Shapiro is, so I don't think I need to explain that. He was on Dave Rubin's show and he was making a comment that um, it's different when an 81 year old person dies than a 20 year old. I don't know ex the exact wording that he used, but of course this is true. This doesn't mean that the 81 year old's life is less valuable than the 20 year old. It just means that because this is uh, a sickness because this is a virus that is mostly affecting older people, we perceive it differently. We, we just do. We perceive it differently than if it was killing all five-year-olds or all 15-year-olds or all 20-year-olds. And then this stupid, bad faith argument broke out about how not just Ben Shapiro, but all conservatives are willing to sacrifice the elderly in order to help the economy, which they just demean as just wanting to help our 401k or just to fatten up our wallet, as if the economy doesn't affect poor people, as if the economy doesn't uh, help people provide for their families and put food on their table, as if the economy doesn't affect all of these very real needs for a lot of people, far beyond people's 401k. And it's so stupid. There was an in bad faith conversation about sacrificing older people on behalf of the economy when I, that is not what Ben Shapiro was saying. That is not what anyone uh, believes that I know. Here's the bottom line is that all lives are equally valuable. As Christians, we know that all people are made in the image of God, but we are always in every decision we make, yes, in public policy, but in every decision we make in our everyday lives, we are assessing risk versus reward. Like we are looking at probabilities in everything we do. We do it uh, subconsciously. Like we know that it's dangerous to drive. 
We know that it's more dangerous technically to drive than it is to fly. Like you are more likely to get in a car crash than you are in a plane crash. And yet sometimes we decide that we are going to drive to our vacation spot because it's cheaper, because we don't want to deal with, you know, carrying on luggage or you're traveling with a bunch of kids and so you don't want to worry about that and so you are assessing the risk you are assessing the benefits that's what we do in everyday life and that's unfortunately very unfortunately the responsibility that a lot of government leaders have right now is that they are looking at the risks of the lockdown and the rewards of opening back up the economy and they are trying to figure out what the balance is and what is best for their area. One of the risks is that yes, once you open things back up, people are going to interact. Hopefully people will be responsible. Hopefully people will socially distance and all of that good stuff, but people are going to get sick. I mean, we just pass viruses to each other. We pass uh, germs to each other. That's just going to happen. And so the infection rate is going to go up. That means inevitably that the death rate will go up. And very tragically and very unfortunately, uh, the most vulnerable to this virus, elderly people, may be more affected by this. Now, hopefully not, because uh, I still think that even if everything else opens back up, that the elderly should stay inside. I don't know until when, I don't know like the magic day or the magic qualification for when they should, uh, for you know, when elderly people can go back to living life as normal. I mean, ultimately it is their choice. That's the decision that they make, um, but that is a risk. But there are also risks to children, to people with special needs, to people with mental health issues, to people with cancer, to people who have to access all of the services that have been shut down because of this lockdown. So there are risks to staying shut down. There are risks to opening back up to vulnerable communities. So on both sides of the equation, you've got vulnerable communities that are at risk. Government leaders have a very tough decision right now in weighing the risk and reward of each situation. That is the point of all of this. So that is not to say there were even conservatives on Twitter who were firing back to this saying, oh, the lives of the elderly matter. Of course they do. Of course they do. No one is saying that the lives of older people don't matter. But yes, we are treating this differently. Now, if this were a virus that were wiping out everyone 30 and under, and for whatever reason, people 30 and over were uh, you know, unscathed, we would be looking at this a little bit differently because that would mean that the virus is probably a lot stronger, that the virus is killing young and healthy people. It's probably, you know, a lot more dangerous. Yes, we look at deaths differently. We just do. The people were trying to, it's all a big virtue signal. If you don't know what virtue signal means, it just means something that you say to sound virtuous, but there's no meat in it like there's it's hollow there's nothing behind it it doesn't actually mean anything so all these people trying to attack Ben Shapiro and all the conservatives that want to open things back up strategically and slowly by the way because of the risks of the lockdown and the lack of freedoms but we've talked about that before they were they were giving these stories about their grandparent dying and trying to say that uh See, let me tell you um, how important these lives are. And people were tweeting that to me because I was stupidly, I shouldn't, my rule is do not engage with stupid. But I was trying to say, okay, that's obviously not what was said. Here's what was meant. Here's the idea behind the risk and reward, whatever. And I said something along the lines of um, the reaction is typically, it's typically more severe when young people are dying than people in their 80s dying because as tragic as it is and as equally valuable as the life of elderly people are, they have, they have lived most of their lives now. And people were saying, well, I was absolutely devastated when my grandparent died. Of course, so was I. <laughs> my grandmother died back in October and we were, when I was growing up, we were as close as you could be between a grandmother and a grandchild. And I was devastated when she died. I was very sad, but I was also very thankful 
for the life that she lived, the long life that she got to live and all the people that loved her and all the experiences that she was able to have, all the love that she was able to give. Do I wish she had lived a, a healthy 10 more years? Yes, I would have loved that. I would have loved for her to see me have more babies. I would have loved for her to uh, see my daughter grow up. I would have loved for her to have a good, healthy, solid 10 to 15 years more. I would have loved for her to live into 100 years old. But um, I you know, take comfort in the fact that obviously that God is sovereign, but also that she had a full life. I would not feel the same way about either my parents dying, who are 59 and 60, or a baby dying, or someone of, you know, a cousin my age dying. It would feel um, untimely. It would feel more tragic. Does that mean that their life is more valuable than my grandmother's? No, of course not. There was this article in The Atlantic that said Georgia's experiment in human sacrifice because Georgia is opening slowly and in stages, just like Texas is, opening up their economy. And so people are saying that Governor Kemp and all the people who support him are opting for human sacrifice. No, no. Like I said, every government leader is weighing the risks and rewards. There are risks to vulnerable populations on both ends of this decision. The, the difference is if you open things back up, you can keep the vulnerable uh, the immunocompromised and the elderly, you can keep them quarantined, like you can keep them inside. But all of the people who need services to survive, so the people with special needs, the cancer patients, the people who need these elective surgeries, the people who uh, need their special education in order to thrive, kids who need to go to school, parents who need to go to work and take their kids to daycare, none of those people can access the services that they really need if things stay locked down. So that is the decision people are making. I hate the in bad faith arguments about, oh my gosh, you don't care about people's grandmothers dying. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Like I said, my, uh, my grandmother died and my husband's grandmother died within like six weeks of each other. And it was really hard. Like it was really hard for both of us. And it has to be even harder now because you can't even plan the same funeral that you would. You can't even celebrate their lives in the same way that you, the same way that you would outside of a pandemic. So. Yes, I have so much compassion, but let's not let's not pretend like uh, that let's not pretend that we don't weigh risk and rewards in every decision that we make and that our governors aren't making the same kinds of decisions and that the decision would be different if this were disproportionately affecting children and young people. It uh, I, that might be cruel uh, a cruel reality, but that is reality that is reality and for people saying well you're just willing to sacrifice people okay well if that's your if that's your line of reasoning then okay you're saying that everything that involves the risk of hurting someone else should not be done so you have the risk of running over a pedestrian in your car should you not drive your car are you by driving are, are you um, sacrificing pedestrians? No, of course you're not. That is stupid. Again, and this is all coming from the party of abortion and assisted suicide, by the way. So I'm not really interested. Like I said on Twitter, I don't take cues on compassion from people who think that dismembering babies qualifies as empowerment. So spare me just a little bit. Um, okay, let's move on. Since we're about halfway through, let us move on to this Out of Shadows documentary. Just wanted to, I just had been thinking about all of that for the past 24 hours, so I really had to get it out because I was unfortunately involved in stupid conversations on Twitter, people who were just in bad faith making arguments that didn't make any sense. And my rule now is that I just need to plaster on my forehead is don't engage with stupid. Now, I'm not saying that everyone who disagrees with me is stupid, obviously, not even close. I'm not saying that. And I'm not saying everyone who was on the other side of this issue was making stupid arguments. But when people are intentionally misunderstanding and misinterpreting you and making stupid arguments to try to get out of facing the reality of the logic that's in front of them, then yes, that qualifies as stupid and you don't engage. And I regret so much every time I engage with stupidity. I regret it. 
So anyway, that should be that should be your motto too. Just don't engage with that kind of stuff. That doesn't mean that you're not humble and kind and compassionate and willing to engage with people who disagree with you. I do that all the time. But don't don't engage with intentionally stupid. It'll just frustrate you. I think there's a proverb somewhere out there about that. Okay, let's talk about let's talk about this out of shadows that you guys have been asking me about. So finally, I watched this documentary a few weeks ago. I think it was three weeks ago now. And it was, in my opinion, really well made. It was really compelling. So I watched it twice. And that's what I recommend to you. If you watch this, if you haven't watched it already, or if you've only watched it once, I recommend watching it twice. So I watched it, the, or I actually listened to it the first time. I was on a walk and I listened to it. And then I went home and I watched it with my husband and I took notes and things like that. And that's what I encourage you to do. Um, it is, if you haven't listened and you know, you don't feel like watching it and you want to listen to this before you do, that's totally fine. Um, I will give you a little synopsis. So it's centered on a story of an ex stuntman in Hollywood who started hearing about the corrupt and perverse inner workings of Hollywood after he got injured doing a stunt and how Hollywood and the government, specifically our intelligence agencies, are in bed with one another. And there's this incestuous relationship, the documentary claims, between the CIA, for example, and Hollywood. And the CIA uses Hollywood to basically brainwash us, among other things. Um, it argues, this documentary, that Satan, uh, Satanism is rampant in Hollywood and even parts of our US intelligence and that that influences the pervasive, but mostly not talked about or not talked about enough pedophilia in these powerful spheres, uh, which is what, if I'm not mistaken, connects this in this documentary, which is what connects that idea that pedophilia is rampant in these spheres, connects this documentary to talking about Pizzagate, which is a long story to explain, and I won't get into all of it, but basically involves this pizza parlor in DC that people had reason to believe was, um, well, the reason that they believed it was because of these emails by the Podesta brothers that was leaked to WikiLeaks that people investigated, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but so because of those emails, they believed that this pizza parlor in DC was being used as a front for a pedophile ring, uh, the clients of which included people this documentary claims, uh, like the Podesta brothers, John and Tony Podesta are Democratic uh, political advisors. It was reported on at the time by a journalist named of Liz Corkin. She is in this documentary. She has been since ostracized by the mainstream media for writing about it. Uh, the documentary is basically about how the many powers that the the, the powers that be in uh, D.C. and in Hollywood are in cahoots to desensitize us to evil, to manipulate our minds, to push immorality, and that uh, many in these arenas have sold their souls to the devil and have played either active or passive parts in child sex trafficking and pedophilia. And even though the documentary didn't address this, what I'm going to talk about also has to do with Q or QAnon. I think that's how you say it. I've never followed Q. All that I know about Q is what I researched for this podcast episode. I don't even really know how to explain it properly, except that it's this anonymous person with lots of internet followers, claims to have special intelligence, to be in the know, has special insight, uh, they claim, into what's really going on behind the scenes in the government. Uh, followers of Q believe that President Trump is an enemy of the deep state an enemy of these evil forces, and even that this whole pandemic response is really about him fighting against this, quote, cabal of elites whom they believe are a bunch of pedophiles. They have accused Tom Hanks, Oprah, Ellen, the Clintons of all being a part of this, and they believe that these people are going to get arrested during all of this if they have not already. Okay, I think that was a pretty good synopsis. So Q out of shadows, they go hand in hand because the people who made this documentary, they are followers and promoters of Q and their messages and things like that. So I hope that was a fair and accurate assessment. That's my goal. I'm not trying to exaggerate. I'm not trying to deceive or leave anything out. Um, so if you watched the documentary, this will all make a lot more sense, all what I'm about to say. So after watching it, here's what I, here's what I know is true. And here's why, if you watch it, you could walk away from this saying it's totally believable. 
It's because as Christians, we know that there is real good and real evil. We know that Satan is real. Ephesians 2 describes Satan as the prince of the power of the air. Ephesians 6 talks about our battle, our spiritual battle against the present powers of this, uh, the powers of this present darkness. Satan's authority is real and influential. There are really people who worship Satan. There are really people, particularly in Hollywood, who practice witchcraft, which isn't explicit worship of Satan in name, but is a satanic ritual. We've talked about that on this podcast. That is real. Go back and listen to two episodes. One titled The Dangers of the New Age with Doreen Virtue, and the second titled The Rise of Millennial Witches, two of my most popular podcast episodes because I point to the, we point to the real examples of this kind of stuff happening in modern culture and how we are in fact getting desensitized to it, especially as women. So we know as Christians that evil does exist, that Satan worship does exist, that uh, real witchcraft exists. We know that child abuse and exploitation uh, and witchcraft and all sorts of paganism go hand in hand. They always have historically. Again, go listen to the rise of millennial witches. We talk about that specifically, or you can watch it on YouTube. We know obviously that pedophiles exist. We know that child sex trafficking is an underground industry worth billions of dollars. Um, it's unfortunately made up of very powerful people. We know that of course the media in Hollywood tried to create uh, social and political change through their messaging. Absolutely. However, okay. However, I am not sure. I'm, I'm not sure that there is a conscious and concerted conspiracy to do so. Here's where things started to kind of break down for me in the documentary. Um, or here's an example of something that didn't make sense and then kind of made me skeptical about a lot of things after I heard this. So there's a part when the main person tries to prove that uh, tries to prove that we are being brainwashed, not just by Hollywood, which I can get on board with, but the media in relation to Hollywood and I'm, or, uh, sorry, the, the elites, the, uh, de sorry, I forgot what I was about to say. The politicians, uh, the intelligence communities that they are in bed with Hollywood to come up with specific programming in order to make us think a certain way in a way that reflects some sort of paganism and Satanism. Now I'm not saying that there aren't really bad actors in our intelligence communities. This whole saga with the Mike Flynn thing can tell us that absolutely that is true, but I'm not sure I see evidence for some conspiracy between the government and between Hollywood to program our minds to believe certain things based on this documentary. One of the proofs that he tries to convey is the are are the names of the things that we are watching. So the names of these components of the media. So he says, for example, that uh, what does television mean? Well, it's tell a vision. So a vision like a sorceress. What's on a television? channels. So you're channeling different spirits. What are on the channels? A program. So you're getting programmed. And what's the singular form of media? Medium. So he uses the names of these things to try to point to this kind of supernatural, corrupt, pagan thing that is going on between all of these different spheres of power. But sure, Yes, I guess these words, if you break them down, they sound like those things, but these words are also derivatives. So that argument is not a proof to what this documentary is trying to say. Like, let's do some etymology real fast. Television is called television because that's exactly what it is. The prefix tella doesn't mean tell a, uh, like T-E-L-L-A -L -L -uh, or tell a tella is a Greek prefix that means at, over, from, or to a distance, like telegraph, teleport, a telephone, television isn't broken down into tell a vision. It's broken down to mean vision. What we see on the TV screen um, is being transferred to us. So our vision is seeing something that is being transferred over to us. That's what television means. He says that it's secretly nefarious that there are 
TV channels because they're channeling something. Well, they're called channels because the word is derived from the Latin word meaning canalis, which meant waterway. And a channel like the English channel still conveys that meaning. In the same way, a television channel is a means or a way through which you are receiving a particular program. Program, yes, that can mean that something is uh, programmed, that are computer programs, people can be programmed to think a certain way. And there's no doubt that shows can program us to think a particular way. But there are other things called programs that are not that. Like if you go to a dance recital, are they programming you when they hand you the pamphlet that tells you what kind of dances that you are going to see? No, it's called a program because it's in order. It's a series of things. It's an order of events. It's an arrangement of things. Um, he said something else that struck me as hang on a second, I'm not, I'm not totally sure about that. He claimed that the CIA is basically existing with impunity. Uh, no one ever checks in on what the CIA is doing. He said, when's the last time? When's the last time you heard any kind of questioning or investigation of the CIA? Uh, they're in bed with Hollywood, I think the thinking goes. And the reason no one checks on them is because the deep state is so corrupt and their corrupt or their connection with powerful people in Hollywood makes them immune to scrutiny. And so he says that all of these shows try to depict the CIA and intelligence communities as being completely, you know, above reproach. And that's why there are no investigations of the CIA. Uh, like I said, he said, when's the last time you've seen that? Well, there are a couple, at least in the past couple decades, there was Iran-Contra, that's still controversial today, and there was the Petraeus scandal just from a few years ago. So these were two situations in which people were looking pretty deeply into the CIA, not to mention a lot of the stuff that has happened while Trump has been president. People have been very skeptical of the CIA and the FBI. So this, to me... Oh, these were really a couple examples of an attempt to bridge things together, but upon some critical thinking made you realize that they were a little bit of a reach. Um, and there were a few instances of that where things weren't really bridged together. It was more of a mosaic of real experiences, of some true history, of some verifiable connections, verifiable connections and facts, along with what seemed like conjecture and implied connections. So for example, the documentary talks about how the government and Hollywood are in bed with each other, also talks about how Hollywood is into Satanism, which like I said, I'm sure, I am sure that that is true of some celebrities, but there wasn't a solid bridge in the documentary from that assertion to Pizzagate. Pizzagate, didn't have to do with Hollywood exactly. Maybe the bridge was Marina Abramovic, who does spirit cooking, a pagan satanic practice. She was included in the Podesta emails, maybe. But that connection and transition was not clearly demonstrated. Like, I'm really trying to reach for that kind of connection. The first part of the documentary is super interesting. It's a super interesting rendering of the stuntman's experience in Hollywood, but it's lacking a lot of detail. Like we don't know the timeline. I'm confused about the timeline of his life and his career and when he was figuring this stuff out, how this documentary came together and why and the things and the events, the specific events and information and sources that led him here. Uh, there was a lot of vagueness that is really missable because of how well the documentary is. Like I said, I encourage you to watch it twice. Now, if there's anything wrong that I'm saying or if there's anything I'm leaving out, please like let me know, email me, and I, I would love to hear from you because you can watch it and you have a more recent memory than I do. Watch it twice, take notes, ask questions. Maybe you are skeptical about some other things that I also uh, that I also missed. Uh, it's easy to finish watching this and just say, yeah, I believe that's all happening because it is absolutely true, like we said, that evil exists and evil knows no bounds. And so it is always within the realm of possibility that things like this could occur. We know that. We know that there are pervs. We know that there are pedophiles. We know Hollywood has a pedophile problem. We know that there are pervy, powerful, pedophilic people. Uh, so there are pieces of this documentary that are verifiably true. But what it's missing is solid glue, solid, factual, verifiable connections. So here's what we don't know. We do not know. We do not know, based on the evidence at hand, based on this documentary, that there is a deep state effort 
conjoined with Hollywood to commercialize pedophilia and that there is a cabal that is running this. Now, do we see the beginnings of acceptance of pedophilia by renaming pedophiles things like minor attracted person? Yes. We see the sexualization of kids and the transgender and drag movement? Yes. Because again, real evil and perversion exists, uh, but the pedophilia and trafficking being pushed by the deep state along with people like Tom Hanks and Oprah, like these are claims that a lot of these people are making in the Q world. And Trump is secretly battling this cabal and using the coronavirus as a cover to rescue kids from sex trafficking. That is just not verifiable. I don't see any evidence of that. That's not an assertion, by the way, that particular one that is made in the documentary, but the people who made the documentary are also big promoters of Q, like I said, which is pushing that kind of storyline. Now, we know from the Jeffrey Epstein scandal that there are powerful people in politics, in media, and in Hollywood that traffic, exploit, and take advantage of young women. Teenage girls young as 14 years old were caught up in the whole Jeffrey Epstein disgusting scandal that happened. Uh, these are terrible people of both large and small influence. But there's no evidence that I see to show uh, that there is a secret war being waged between Trump and these powerful forces. There is no evidence that I see to show that coronavirus is a cover for that war. And some of the people who are being accused of being a part of this cabal cannot be proven to be a part of it. I have no reason to defend, like no personal gain from defending people like Tom Hanks or Oprah, I don't know them, but it is a very serious allegation that they are sex traffickers. And unless you know that for an absolute fact, unless you know that for a fact, it is an evil idea to push. Again, that's not in this documentary, but it is a Q theory. If you go to their Instagrams, you can look at their comments and you can see comments from a lot of these people. But there are other names dropped in the documentary implying that maybe they're connected with this whole quote cabal and we don't know that. And so to say that you know that is wrong. And there's another layer to this, again, not explicitly in the documentary, but connected to all of it. And if you follow the people that are uh, talking about these theories, you will also see promotion of the idea that all of this is bringing on a spiritual revival, that this is all all of this is God's plan. I guess this is more of a post-millennialist view. I am a pre-millennialist, but a post-millennialist view, obviously not all post mill people believe this, but a post-millennialist view that things are going to get better, that God, uh, that the gospel is going to spread uh, more and more. And well, we know that's true, but that things are going to start conforming more and more to God's law. So I guess this is more of a post mill view that these people are holding. Um, they were, a lot of these people were also talking about the idea back in February that if the Chiefs won the Super Bowl, that would mean there is a revival coming. And that is superstition, guys. Like, that's superstition. That is not based on the Word of God. Like, that's not a, a biblical idea. And I hope and pray for an awakening in this country. Can God do that? Absolutely. Please, Jesus. I am 100% here for a spiritual awakening. But this narrative that's going on between this documentary and Q theories and things like that is very strangely intertwined. Uh, that the real battle of good and evil, the true spiritual battle happening between God and the devil is between the liberal globalists and who they call the patriots. I'm not sure about that. Like, don't get me wrong. I am no fan. You guys know that. I'm no fan of liberal globalists. I do believe that they push a whole lot of evil pushing global socialism, the obliteration of individual liberty and general moral degeneracy, everything George Soros is behind, for example, or much of the agenda of the WHO and the UN and Planned Parenthood. But some of the details about particular celebrities and politicians, the deep state coronavirus, President Trump, I do not see evidence for that. Here's the deal. Conservatives are naturally skeptical. That's part of the reason why we are conservative. Like we are skeptical of the powers that be. We're skeptical of big institutions. We're skeptical of bureaucracy. We're skeptical of the things that we don't see. We carry the spirit of our founding fathers who always bucked against, uh, who bucked against tyranny and the taking away of our freedoms. We are um, scared of that. We are fearful of that in what I think is a healthy way. And I think that this the theories 
in some of this document in in this documentary uh some of which are pushed in this documentary even though i think the basis for a lot of them or part of a lot of them may be grounded in truth that there are evil terrible predatory people out there um the glue that holds it together and the facts that are meant to hold it together are not verifiable here's the deal conservatives are naturally skeptical we're naturally skeptical of institutions and we are obviously skeptical of institutions that are pushing moral relativism and immorality and we are skeptical of uh, predators and we are skeptical of people who would take advantage of the weak we are skeptical of the powers that be that is normal but I think that we need to be very careful not following superstition and not following things that haven't been verified because it satiates our skepticism of institutionalized power. Um, I think that where we go for truth, I know where we go for truth is the word of God. Be careful. Be careful. Keep on weighing the things that you hear, whether it's from the mainstream media or whether it's from an Instagram account that's propagating this kind of stuff, make sure that you compare it to the word of God. Like make sure that it's biblical. And if you don't know what to believe, like you don't have to worry about researching this documentary. Like you don't have to worry about researching Q. You don't have to worry about following along with it because you know God is sovereign. God tells you what to do. God tells you not to follow all the superstitions or all the theories, conspiracy theory or not, that the world is following. Like this is not... Uh, I know that a lot of people who are in this world think this is like some special calling from God. Like this is the almost like true church. Like this is the true movement that God is doing. This is not the true movement that God is doing. God is calling believers to do what he has always called believers to do, which is to obey him, to pray, to share the gospel and to serve and love your neighbor. Like if you are finding yourself winding down this road of theories, whether it's from this source or anything else, and I'm not saying everyone in the documentary is doing this, but if you as an individual are finding yourself going down this road, trying to research all of these things, then I think you just need to take a step back and realize that God is in control. Is knowledge important? Yes, I think research is great. And to realize that there are really evil people that will exploit our children and want their minds and want us to believe certain things, absolutely. But obsessing over it and constantly researching it and looking for all of these you know, different connections until you work yourself into a tizzy, but you're so anxious because you don't know what to do, I don't think that's what God is calling you to do. I think God is calling you to be the hands and feet of him, which he will empower you to do through the Holy Spirit and with the help of the church. Like that is what we are called to do. We are not called to work ourselves up with anxiety about things that are just not verifiable. Um, so I'm sure that this podcast episode made a lot of people mad. I am like, I am more than happy to have Liz Gorkin on, uh, on my podcast and and talk to people about this, but I'm just telling you my honest assessment. I enjoyed the documentary, but I think that in all things, and I hope that Liz and all the people who made this documentary would agree with me, like we have to be skeptical. We have to check things out. We have to make sure that things are connected before we run with them. So this is my honest, uh, skeptical pushback and assessment of it. Thank you guys so much for listening. I will be back here on Monday.